and the debris of the English sky, unidentified flying objects. equivalent of Loch Ness Monsters, or should we take them seriously, as apparently a lot of people do? Andrew Mulligan reports. Flying saucers, unidentified flying objects, UFOs for short. Last week, two police officers witnessed the strange aerobatics of a glowing object over the new forest. The Ministry of Defence and the UFO clubs are bombarded with sighting reports from all over Britain, yet no one really knows what they are. The vast majority are explained away, but a worrying 4% remain, unidentified and unexplained. Astronomers and scientists have seen them. Reliable military sources have tracked them from aircraft and on radar. UFOs are multiform. They come in squares, ovals and mushrooms. Watchers are getting organized with watch-ins. They've developed their own special techniques. With all this, extraterrestrial communications are no longer telepathic. The Eleven Ham radio stations, all linked to a central data control in London, radio sighting reports. Their objective is to collect information. This is an astral compass. I'm just trying to set it up now. And we use it to detect, to detect the altitude and bearing of UFOs, or flying saucers. Now, we're here in Guildford on Purely Downs, and we know exactly our position, where we are on the map, and we've got a trigonometrical point. And I'm setting it up now, and the idea of this is, if we spot a UFO, we focus onto it, we get its height, we get its bearing, and we flash a signal to our position, which is exactly half a mile away up there, and they do the same. They get a bearing and a point, fixed point onto it, and therefore we'd be able to work out exactly its height, its speed, its altitude, and possibly conceivably also its size. Vanny, how did you come to believe in flying saucers? Well, I work at London Airport. I'm an aircraft engineer, and naturally I keep an interest in things that happen in the air. And there are too many reports, too many good, reliable, convincing reports of strange phenomena appearing in our skies. And uh, I've actually done a lot of sky watching myself the last few years, and I've seen three inexplicable objects. People call them flying saucers, UFOs, but they're definitely inexplicable. They're nothing common, no they're definitely no balloons or any known aerial uh, objects that we can definitely pinpoint and identify. The Sky Watchers are a motley group. They come in droves, armed for their all-night vigil with blankets, thermoses and deck chairs. Since 1959, British Sky Watchers have filed over 3,000 reports, of which 400 were evaluated as genuine. Yet our sky watching is academic. Colorado now has a quarter million dollar budget to investigate 20 specially chosen cases. The body of evidence grows. There have been eight vintage years since the turn of the century when UFO activities have reached a peak. G3VPQ, 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 G3WKT, Portable Guildford calling. Uh, calling for a report, please. Calling for a report. Uh, will you go ahead, please, Ivor? Will you go ahead with your report, please? Go ahead, go ahead. Colin McCarthy, an Australian electronic specialist, first investigated UFOs when tracking rockets in Australia. He has lent rationality to a subject fraught with crankery and mystics. When an object is sighted, McCarthy reports it to control or receives news of other UFO activity. Uh, 
Roger, Roger. Understand, understand. A cigar-shaped object was seen six minutes ago west of Essex. Colin, in the light of your scientific experience, do you believe in these unidentified objects? Well, I must say, for years I didn't believe in them, but um, after working for the National Aeronautic and Space Administration, I have now come to the conclusion these objects do in fact exist, because I did see a file of papers that you couldn't jump over, literally, and uh, all these reports, all these papers, consist of reports from the last 10, 15 years, and they're genuine reports, too, reports that have been, in fact, evaluated. To what extent has um, scientific fact been clouded by the occult and certain mysticism which seems to surround flying saucers? Well, this is a very unfortunate point, I'm afraid. Um, for years now, the lunatic fringe, we term them, uh, of people who claim contact with Martians and Venusians and spaceships have landed in their backyard have... Uh, come onto the scene, or onto the bandwagon, to use that term, and it has definitely clouded scientific research, because the average member of the public now uh, is uh, uh, dead against flying sources for the simple reason they had reports of these people. UFO detectors are made to register magnetic flux. McCarthy developed a commercial UFO detector. It's cost six pounds two and six. So far, it's buzzed five times. On one occasion, he claims because a UFO overflew his home. Hey. Do your friends think you're completely mad coming out here on a windy night? They do, yes. What would they be doing at the moment? Well, I'd rather be out of the pictures or home in bed, I think. Well, why do you come out here? Well, I'm interested. I'm, you know. How long have you been interested? Um, only since I met Richard about 18 months ago. And ever since then you've become a, yeah. a fan? Yes. What about these friends of yours? Have you been able to convert them at all to...? No, not really, no. Perhaps they come here basically to, in the hope of uh, seeing an unidentified flying object. Um, but another reason is perhaps to familiarise myself with the um, various star constellations uh, and other phenomena that one frequently does see in the sky. Have you ever seen a flying copy before? I have not myself, no. What would happen if I landed here? Uh, well, I would hope that the research groups up here would be uh, sufficiently well briefed to take pictorial and sound records. What would you of do? The event. Would you immediately reach your camera or what? I think I would probably reach my camera, yes, which is uh, still. Uh, in other words, you're trying to prove something, aren't you? We are. We're trying to prove that UFOs, unidentified flying objects, exist. That these objects are spacecraft from other worlds. I see. Thank you. Uh, tell me, I think you saw a flying saucer the other day, didn't you? Yes, well, I saw one on the 2nd of June with my friend Joey. Uh, we was over the char trees, a little camping site. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was about 1 o'clock a.m. in the morning on, I think it was Saturday night. And, uh, we woke up by this uh, noise. What sort of a noise was it? Well, it uh, was sort of a sucking noise. What did it look like? Uh, well, it was oval shaped with short and stubby wings that all lights were open. I see. Was it travelling fast? Well, it's about medium. <laughs> when you say medium, how fast? As fast as a plane? No, um... As fast well, as a train? It didn't go so fast that you lost sight of it altogether. Yeah, we saw it. There's no doubt about that. Yes. Yeah. And how far away was it from you? Uh, I think that was about up ahead over the campsite. Although sky watching has the obvious amateurism of village cricket, its sincerity is beyond doubt. The sky watcher's faith is unshakable. It's a faith based on a fraction of inexplicable fact. Now, in the height of the sky watching season, they sit at four points of the compass gazing hopefully for precious proof that fiction has at last become science. If they find this proof, Colin McCarthy for one will not be surprised. Colin, suppose that UFOs are proven and accepted, where would it all lead? Well, where it all leads is, is a matter for conjecture, but I, I feel that uh, at this moment uh, we are in fact being watched from space, from a, an extraterrestrial civilization, and it seems at the moment that they have no desire to contact us. Perhaps
perhaps uh, we're merely a psychological experiment. I think uh, we are very adolescent with our wars and our internal strife, and perhaps they're, they're merely interested in watching us uh, to see the reactions of a, of a planet that's uh, on the verge of either destroying itself or growing up. Um, it, it's, a, it's a mute point here, but I think that, uh, well, I know now from my own research is that UFOs exist. As to where they come from, um, I don't know. I have a feeling that, that perhaps they are extraterrestrial, I should say extrastellar. They come from other solar systems because I think that uh, this solar system may not be capable of supporting life as we know it. Um, and I think they have conquered this, uh, this apparent uh, speed of light uh, barrier and possibly are arriving from, from distances. Um, which we can't grasp at the moment. But I think they are here for a purpose, and that purpose uh, is merely to watch us. And we'll have them on panorama as soon as they arrive. Until next week, they o'clock. Good okay, night. Good. Robert Cootie, present at the Skywatch, gives this account of it in a local paper. When I arrived on the Downs, the group was already busy. There were many people sitting in chairs, and the mobile HQ radio was buzzing with reports of UFOs. At this time, the reports were of a cigar UFO seen over Essex. A team from BBC's Panorama was filming the event. The sky was cloudy at first, then clear after a while. Very little happened until darkness fell. Several aircraft flew overhead, and served to demonstrate how they could easily be mistaken at a distance. The four-person two-hours-on-watch system didn't seem to be used, and several watchers stayed up all night, notably Mr. O. Fowler and Mr. R. I shall be eternally grateful for an early morning coffee served to a very frozen me. Just before midnight, there was a cry of, Cigar over the moon! Across the face of the moon was a thin line that seemed to sink and tilted slightly before disappearing below the moon. When first sighted, it had been about three quarters of the diameter to the moon, of the moon and central to it, so that it terminated at both ends. It couldn't have been a cable of any sort, because there were no cables in that direction. It could have been a freak vapour trail, but a vapour trail would probably have spread, and the line was so thin and of uniform thickness. Later on, an object that flickered very fast passed overhead, but was said to be a decaying satellite. None of the three UFO detectors made a cheap. At about 2.30 Sunday morning, a cloud crept onto the downs. This obscured the sky from then onwards. There had been one other UFO during the Skywatch, a strange light that appeared twice. It was also seen by Jimmy Goddard, who had gone to watch at the Hog's Back. The summer of 1967 was in the centre of a Europe-wide UFO flap, many sightings being made in Surrey. Among them were sisters Catherine and Susan Giles of Potter's Lane, Send. They were taking a neighbour's dog for a walk when, said Catherine, we sighted what can only be described as an unidentified flying object. It appeared over the brow of the field between Send Hill and Cricket Hill at 9.35pm. It appeared as two bright lights close together at about 100 to 150 feet above the field and moved towards us at the bottom of Cricket Hill. It was like this for two or three minutes, then the lights dimmed to pinpricks of light and disappeared. We differ on the next point. I believe that I saw a fat cigar-shaped object. My sister thinks it was round. There was a slight hum as the unlit object moved away and seemed to disappear into the clouds, and we no longer heard any sound. The lights appeared from the north and turned east. Mysterious lights were also seen at the same time Sunday evening by News and Mail chief reporter Tony Miller, but from a spot about seven miles from Send. He saw the lights from the Red Road Hill at Bagshot Heath. He said, I was driving down the hill and noticed the lights above distant trees. There were two lights side by side. They were very bright and appeared from the short time that I saw them to be stationary. I lost sight of them behind hills after about ten seconds. It was difficult to estimate the distance that the lights were away although they were certainly in the direction of Send, and that's approximately east. Many people must have seen the lights. They were so obvious. A few days after the Skywatch, I had a letter from a squadron leader, Dennis Shipwright, telling me of an unusual close-to-the-ground sighting he had made at Newlands Corner, Guildford, on the Tuesday following the watch. He saw what at first he thought was a white horse galloping in a field. He was actually looking down on it, into a field below Newlands Corner Hill. It seemed to be a white, 
and egg-shaped, moving up and down the field quickly. Then it changed direction and moved slowly across it and over a hedge. A few days afterwards, my father and I, and Dennis Shipwright, went to the field and found a large reddish stone and several smaller ones where the object had been moving fast. The large stone had what seemed to be a triangular design in the top of it. In 1965, an Atlas rocket sent the Mariner 4 probe on a 325 million mile, seven month journey to Mars. What came back were the first close up views of a planet other than our own. Two years before the Albury sighting, on July the 14th, 1965, the space probe Mariner 4 took the first close up pictures of Mars. The best of these showed an area called Atlantis between Mare Serenium and Mare Cimmerium. I noticed a number of bright spots on the picture and tried aligning them with natural features. I was interested to find that the alignments, although of only three points each, formed an isosceles triangle with a perpendicular, a pattern noted frequently in lays on Earth. When the Albury sighting occurred, I was even more interested to see the similarity between the markings on it and the features of the Mariner 4 photograph. The triangle is of about the same proportions, and there is even a depression at the apex where the craterlet centre is on the picture. The stone is also a somewhat Mars-like colour. One of the smaller stones, originally in the same colour, was left out in the weather by Dennis Shipwright, and it was noticed that it discoloured very quickly. This seems to show that the stones couldn't have been in the field very long. <laughs> 